This morning we are turning to Revelation chapter 1, verse 9 through verse 20 for our scripture reading. The last two verses, verses 19 and 20, I will read, but save the exposition of them for a later message. But beginning with the ninth verse through the 20th verse of chapter 1. The Apostle writes, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribu tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Incidentally, that uh, means not that he was there to preach, although no doubt he gave his testimony, but he was on a he was there on account of past preaching of the word, uh, undoubtedly in some form of exile. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. I've omitted reading the words, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, not because they are not true titles that are applicable to our Lord, but they are not found in the manuscripts that are regarded by most New Testament scholars as better manuscripts. And now verse 12, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. In the original text, those are reversed, and uh, John wrote, most likely, and have the keys of death and hell, or Hades. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. May the Lord bless this reading of his word, and let's bow together in a moment of prayer. Father, we are grateful to thee that thou hast given to us the apocalypse, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and made it possible for the Apostle John to give the revelation specifically to us through the handing down of the Word of God given to him. What a great blessing it is to have a word from heaven concerning the Son of God and concerning us, who are the objects of the ministry that he engaged in and that he carried to a successful conclusion, and that ultimately is the ground for the redemption that we experience. We are indeed thankful, Lord, and we praise Thee that by Thy grace 
And through the love and loving kindness of a heavenly Father, we have the forgiveness of our sins. And not only the forgiveness of our sins, but have been established in a such a relationship to thee that thou hast said a righteousness is ours that is satisfactory to thee. We praise thee, we thank thee, who could ever express, Lord, to thee all that this means. We look forward to the ages of eternity as we learn that which thou hast done for us. We pray for the whole church of Jesus Christ today, the church of which we are a part, and a local manifestation of it. May each genuine member of that body be strengthened today through the word of God and through the relationships that we have with one another in Christ. We pray for Believer's Chapel and its ministries, for those who have the rule over us, our elders, and for those who help them in the ministry, the deacons and others as well. We pray especially for the sick, encourage them, supply their needs, minister to them in a way that, if it please thee, will bring them healing, and bless, Lord, the testimony of this body and this city. We pray for its outreach in various forms, in Bible classes, over the radio, through the tape ministry, and through the written ministry that has been going out, we commit it all to thee. And we pray for those who labor here, the staff and others. Strengthen them, bless them, bless their families. Give them, Lord, the sense of a heavenly reward for their faithfulness in the work of the Lord. And Father, we pray that as the days go by, we may truly come to know Thee in a deeper way. We sense, each of us, that we need a spiritual relationship with Thee that deepens as the days go by. Give us, Lord, the privilege of that experience. We commit the meetings of this day to Thee, not only this meeting, but especially the Sunday School, when the young people and the children are ministered to, and may our day climax in a memorable time around the Lord's table. We commit our time to Thee, we commit the church to Thee, and we ask Thy blessing upon our country and the leadership that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. There is one way that uh, we fall behind in privilege those who were here upon the earth when our Lord was here, and the obvious way is that we do not know the physical appearance of our Lord. Many have wished to know the appearance of Christ, as is evidenced by the differing kinds of pictures that one finds in Christians' homes. You've visited many homes of Christians, and you've seen such pictures as the face of Christ. You've seen pictures by Holman Hunt, such as Christ knocking upon the door, the handle of the door being on the inside, and the message obvious that the response to our Lord is ultimately dependent upon the way in which we respond by the grace of God through the Holy Spirit. You've seen pictures of our Lord as a shepherd with his flock, and you've seen pictures of the praying Christ. All of those are attempts to set forth aspects of our Lord's life and ministry that have, in a sense, appealed to us. But all of them are, in one sense, false because, of course, they represent an incorruptible Lord by features that are corruptible. In fact, any picture of our Lord is deficient for that reason. 
some time ago I ran across a, a picture in one of the magazines that I had looked at and it was of a Chinese photographer who had taken this picture and he had taken a picture simply of some snow and he was startled when the picture was developed to find a picture of our Lord and it was represented and uh, I don't think you can see it but the way in which you look at it probably is the way it looked at it. I want to tell you that I had not looked at this in about four or five years and I looked at it myself and could not make out the picture of Christ that was found in the snow until finally I turned it this way and one can see that the picture of our Lord dominates the snow. He thought it was the way in which God had spoken to him and as a result, according to the explanation of the photograph, it was the result of it was that he himself felt that was a message from the Lord to him and so he became a Christian. We are, all of us, interested in the question, what did our Lord look like? Some of us think that perhaps we ought to abandon the whole idea and never let it even enter our minds. But Christians ought to be interested in how our Lord looked for the simple reason that the Christian faith is an historical faith. That is, it's the story and the ministry and the truth of the incarnation of the Son of God who lived in our midst at a particular time in history. And so everything that has to do with our Lord and His ministry in simple historical terms is something that should be of interest to every one of us. For example, if we should find out that our Lord had red hair and that he walked with a limp, or he had a curious little mannerism with his right hand as he spoke, or uh, other forms of uh, personal manifestations, they would be of truly of interest to us and validly of interest to us because he is an historical figure. He, of course, for us, is not simply a figure who lived in history, but who has continued to live in the eternity of the right hand of the throne of God. All of these things are of significance for us, but of minimal significance so far as the ministry of our Lord is concerned. We are not so much interested in how He looked and the mannerisms He may have had, as we are in the significance of the life and death and resurrection. But those things are validly of Christian interest and in fact ought to be for every one of us. The picture that we have just read, however, is not the kind of picture that could be called an historical manifestation. It obviously is a symbolic and spiritual representation of the person and also of the work of our Lord. It surely is not physical, as you can see. It's in the book of Revelation itself, it serves as a kind of frontispiece of the emperor of the earth. And it's designed to be of comfort to those who read it. For the book of the Revelation was a book that was issued in a time of historical upheaval, domitian, that evil Roman emperor was on the throne of the empire. And so the picture of the book of, of the Lord in the book of Revelation is designed to explain who he is in measure and to comfort those who were under great persecution. Now the prelude to the vision is given in verse 9, 10, and 11. The apostle writes as one who has received this from God, from Christ, to give to his servants 
He says, I, John, who am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos on account of the word of God and on account of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Patmos is a very small island, 10 miles by 5 miles, shaped in the form of a crescent with the points of the crescent facing east toward Asia Minor. Off the coast, not too far, I think about 40 miles from Ephesus, so that when one left Ephesus, and that was a busy port in those days, and on the way to Rome, the first stop on the way to Rome, or the last stop on the journey from Rome to Ephesus would be the Isle of Patmos. It has a lovely little harbor because of that crescent. And uh, the apostle was there on account of his preaching of the word of God and the testimony that he gave to the Lord Jesus Christ. Patmos was one of the Sporides Islands. There are a number of them along the coast. Many of you have been there and you know about it. Perhaps your ship docked at Patmos and you had a chance to go ashore and there have an opportunity to buy the trinkets that the, the tourists do now when they come to that little island. So John was in the Isle of Patmos. He says he was a companion of our fellow believers in his day in the tribulation and in the kingdom and in the patience of Jesus Christ. In a sense, the apostle is simply saying that he was experiencing the university of Christian experience. He was like all of those who are followers in our Lord, of our Lord, was seeking in his daily life to represent our Lord. He was in a sense telling us that as Ezekiel told his readers in his day, when he reached Tel Aviv by the river Kedar and sat where they sat, he's trying to tell us that the experience that he had is the experience of all of us who are Christians. Now we who live out in Texas, which is the Wild West, we've heard stories about Indians uh, who uh, speak of similar experiences as wearing the same moccasins for one day. Well, that's what John is saying. He is a companion of those who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was in the Isle of Patmos, having experiences that all Christians should have as a result of testimony to the gospel. Now, you'll notice he goes on to say in verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And so his environment, on the one hand, is a visible, tangible kind of environment. He was in the Isle of Patmos, but in another sense, he was in an invisible environment, the environment of the Holy Spirit. That's characteristic of Christians too, who are in Christ, but also in Dallas. So he is telling us that he was in Patmos, but at the same time on the Lord's day, he was in the Spirit. The expression, the Lord's Day, is perhaps possibly rendered on the day of the Lord. And if that's the sense, then he would be saying, I am carried forward by the Holy Spirit to the future when amidst the great cataclysmic things that are brought to pass by God described in this book, the day of the Lord, the day of judgment upon the whole creation transpires. And so he would be thrown forward into that. A great part of the book has to do with that. But it's unlikely. The expression is probably an expression that refers to the first day of the week. So on the Lord's day, John was in Patmos, but he was in the spirit. And he heard behind him a great voice as of a trumpet, and he was told that he was to write the things that he saw in a book and send them to the seven churches. Now the portrait that follows 
is really an amazing portrait. It would be nice if we could be absolutely sure of the meaning of every one of these descriptions of this magnificent vision that John was given. He turned to see the voice that spoke with him, and he saw seven golden candlesticks. Now later on, he will tell us in the last verse of this chapter that the seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches to whom the messages are to be given. So he sees the Lord then in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And the description that is given to him is that he was like the Son of Man, clothed down to the foot and gird about the paps or the breast with a golden girdle. And thus begins the sevenfold description of our Lord. And we want to stress right at the beginning here that this is a symbolic picture. In fact, John has warned us about that in the first verse of this very chapter when he says, And he sent and signified it by his angel unto the servant John, unto his servant John. We commented in our last message upon the use of that term signified, and in fact, as many commentators have done, both scholarly and unscholarly, have pointed out that it's fair to the meaning to simply pronounce it signified. For semano, which is the term that is used here, is a term that is used of the signs. For example, in the Gospel of John, semeion is the term for a sign. That is, a miracle our Lord performed that has spiritual significance. And the verb has that meaning in many cases and surely has it here. So, he sent and he signified or signified this message. That is, the whole book of Revelation is to be read with the understanding that the apostle has been given a message in symbol. Not everything is in symbol, and sometimes the symbols are explained. But essentially, it is a book full of symbols. So we must beware of taking it in a starkly literal way. There are commentators who tell us that's the way we ought to take it. But I don't think they've really seriously read this particular book and sought to explain what John writes in a starkly literal way. There are many things, of course, that are to be taken literally. There is a danger of seeing so much symbolism in this book that one fails to catch its message at all. There is a little ditty that Bible teachers have often used about symbols, wonderful things in the Bible I see, things that are put there by you and by me. Now that has to do not simply with the understanding of symbols, but it also has to do with theology as well. Wonderful things in the Bible I see, things that are put there by you and by me. So we have to be aware of that. I remember when I first started studying the book of Revelation, I read a little book by H.A. Ironside, or at least something that Dr. Ironside said with reference to this vision. And he said that when he was a little boy, he began to try to draw a picture of Christ from this particular chapter. And he had a great deal of difficulty with the expression, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. He tried as best he could to do this, and finally he took the picture to his father I believe it was his father, and his father said, why did you make his tongue so long? <laughs> well, that's what you ultimately get into if you try to draw, the, draw, draw a picture of our Lord and intend it to be some kind of ordinary picture with these symbolic things. Now, right at the beginning, we are told that he had a garment down to his foot and girt about the breast with a golden girdle. That gives us a little clue of, uh, with reference to the meaning of this vision in the general way. Because kings and priests and prophets 
often wore just such garments. In fact, one can turn to several passages in the Old Testament and find that this is the garment of a priest and of a king. So it's the feeling of most of the commentators that what John is telling us by the clothes that he's wearing is that we have here a symbolic picture of a prophet, a priest, and a king in the kinds of garments that they would wear. Now knowing the teaching of the New Testament, we know that that's the way in which our Lord is presented in the general sense. That is, he's the great prophet promised by Moses. He's the priest who fulfills in his ministry all of the offerings and services typified in the Old Testament Levitical cultus. And he is the king who is the Davidic king of the future, the universal king. So he's the prophet, the priest, and the king. Now I'm going to look just real briefly at each of the seven features of our Lord's picture as set forth here and just suggest to you what the symbols may mean. There is possibility for some disagreement over them, some of the details, but I'm going to give you the way I understand them. And the result is largely the same. Almost all of the commentators who have looked at this particular appearance of our Lord to John have reached the same general conclusion with regard to its meaning. In the 14th verse, we have the first of the features. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. The white suggesting the divine purity. And so he's set forth right in the beginning as a divine, pure individual. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. Possibly also the white has to do with age. So the picture is of an the Ancient of Days. It is say, stated that he is like the Son of Man, and so the eternal, pure, divine individual comes before us first. He also says in the 14th verse, his eyes were as a flame of fire. And penetrating judgment is the sense of that. It's remarkable that the eyes of our Lord are set forth here in this way. And you may remember in the ministry of our Lord, his eyes were of particular significance. In fact, the father of the paralytic came to our Lord and asked him, look upon my son. It's almost as if he sensed that there was a power in the look, the eyes of our Lord. Others ask our Lord to speak. He asked for simply a look. His eyes were as a flame of fire, penetrating judgment. I remember Sir Walter Scott saying of Robbie Burns, whom he knew as a young man, that anyone who ever saw Robert Burns' eyes would never forget them. The same things have been said about Gladstone, Britain's great prime minister. And, of course, of our Lord, we find this in the Word of God suggested in those incidents. The third thing has to do with his feet, and his feet were like unto fine brass. The rays of the brass suggest the swift strength to judge, because brass in the Word of God is frequently linked in the Old Testament with judgment. And so his feet like unto fine brass suggests the judgment that is in his hands. And fourth, we read, his voice is as the sound of many waters, the majestic power. I wonder if the reason that John has this particular picture of our Lord given to him is because the roar of the waves of the Aegean Sea were the constant sound in the ears of the Apostle John. All around that small island, that sea, 
was roaring as the waves hit the shore of it. Small island, all the way around, the roar of the sea constantly in his ears. One thinks of the majestic power of the sea, the beautiful but yet also treacherous Aegean at certain times of the year, the majestic power of the Lord Jesus Christ. One thinks of creation's tenfold God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, and the things that he said came into being. Some years ago I read a description of Niagara Falls by G. Campbell Morgan. He had come to Niagara Falls and he said he just stood before the falls and reflected on the great sounds that those falls make. And if you've ever been by Niagara Falls, you know what I'm talking about, particularly if you're on the Canadian side. Now, the American side is certainly an imposing sight, but if you stand on the Canadian side, you'll have to say in one thing, the Canadians have us beat. For as you stand by the, the falls, the vast sound and the thrust of that water that pours over will make an impression upon you you'll never forget. I'll never forget when I sat there and looked and just stood and looked for a long time. Morgan said as he was standing there, his mind went back not simply to the lick of the river that was pouring over it, but he thought back to the rivers that poured into that particular river, which is like a lake above the falls. And then he thought of the rivulets and the little streams and all of the fact that through many, many parts of the land, water ultimately found its way and over that falls. And then he thought, he said, of how God has spoken to us in the Son. And he thought of the Old Testament, he said, with each of the messages that have to do with our Lord, Isaiah's little stream, Jeremiah's little stream, the rivulet of Habakkuk and Nahum and others, and how they all poured finally into that vast message stream that came over Niagara Falls. His voice is as the sound of many waters. And our Lord, the Son of God, the final message of God contains within himself all of the things that God has spoken by way of prophecy and promise in the Old Testament. And what a sense of majestic power is found in this description, as well as depth of meaning. His voice is as the sound of many waters. We read in the 16th verse, and he had in his right hand, this is the fifth of the descriptions, seven stars, hands, strong, comforting, preservation. Later, we read, he has the seven stars, and the suggestion of being in the hands of our Lord as being the place in which we are absolutely safe comes to us. I think of John chapter 10 and verse 28 and 29 where the Lord Jesus told the men of his day, I give unto them eternal life and they shall perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all and no one is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. In Christ's hands is the place of safety and assurance. So he has the seven stars, the messengers of the churches in his hands. And out of his mouth, the sixth thing, went a sharp two-edged sword, the piercing, stabbing word of God. Oh, how important it is for us to listen to the Word of God and by God's grace 
and power to have our lives conform to the teaching of that word. The word is sharp and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. So out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Later on, we'll read about that so we won't belabor the point, but as you know, that appears very strongly in the description of the second advent. The word of God, however, is powerful when he speaks it. You know, you can look at the Bible, and it really has no effect on you if you look at it. In fact, you can read the Bible, and it may have no effect upon you whatsoever. You can even hear an individual talk about the Bible, such as I am talking about it, and it does not have any effect upon you. The power of the Word of God rests not simply in the fact that it is God's revelation to us, but it rests ultimately in also the Spirit's use of that Word. The Word of God is powerful when it is ministered to us through the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit and the Word that brings transforming change to men. So it's powerful when He speaks it. And finally, in the 16th verse, John writes, and his countenance, his face, was as the sh sun shineth in his strength. The preeminent glory of our Lord suggested by that. One thinks of the Mount of Transfiguration as one of the places in which something of this is manifested. Matthew writes, he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. So his face was as the sun shineth in his strength. Think of the Gospels. In them our Lord and his love, divine love, of course, the love that ultimately is redeeming love, propitiatory love, as we've sought to point out, the love of our Lord is a prominent feature of the ministry of our Lord given in the Gospels. One also notices the sorrows of the Son of Man, which he experiences on his way to the completion of the redemption. He's pictured as a lamb, that is, a sacrificial person by that figure. But in the book of Revelation, it's not that the love of God is not there, for we shall see that it is there, but it's the power of God that has the emphasis, the glory of God, not simply the sorrows of the Son of Man, but the glory of the Son of Man. And as you well know, in a chapter we shall soon expound, a couple of months from now at least, in the fifth chapter he's set forth as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and not simply as a lamb, though that still is a major feature of the book of Revelation. Now that's the symbolic picture. It's a picture of the glory of the Son of God, the greatness of His person, and there's a tremendous suggestion of the judgment that is to be unfolded chapter by chapter in this magnificent book. Now the pronouncements conclude the section. We read, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. You can notice if you put these two together, that is, the things that he says and the picture that has just been given, that the effect of the picture and the statements that accompany it parallel the vision. In other words, these statements help to explain some of the significance of that vision. Fear not, I am the first and the last. Reflect on that for just a moment. In fact, it might do you good if you just went home today 
and spend an hour or two thinking about what is meant by that. I am the first and the last. He's before John the Baptist. In fact, that's what John the Baptist says, you remember? In John chapter 1 and verse 15, the apostle wrote, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. He is before the Baptist, though he came after the Baptist. He is before the prophets, for in the Old Testament time, when they prophesied of the Messiah that should come and of his sufferings and his glories, it was the Spirit of Christ which was in them that led them to so prophesy. He was before Israel, as the apostle points out in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He is before Abraham. Before Abraham was or came to be, I am, the Lord Jesus himself said. He's before the creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things came into being through him before the creation. In fact, he is the eternal Son of God. He's the first and he's the last. No wonder John falls at his feet as if he were dead, awed, but at his feet. As someone has said, it's better to be here and dead than alive anywhere else at the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. Further, I don't say anything about the redemption first and last has its ultimate significance with reference to the redemption that he accomplished. But he goes on to say, I am he that liveth and became dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of death and Hades. So he that liveth and was dead. John, this is no dream. This is no delusion, this is no swoon, this is no coma into which you've fallen. This is an historical experience the apostle has, and he hears the Son of God, whom he has followed for so many years, say, I am he that liveth, and I became dead. That is central to what he is to do is that death as the Lamb of God. But now he's the living Son of God. In fact, he goes on to say, Behold, I am alive forevermore. Twice he says that I'm he that liveth, and I am alive forevermore. He is not dead. He was dead. Now, we have the habit of using crucifixes. And you will see individuals with a little crucifix on their lapel, uh, we hold you blameless today for having come to church in case you have one with a, a crucifix on your lapel. This day you have uh, permission to continue to wear it until you get home. But uh, <laughs> the crucifix is, of course, in one sense very meaningful for us, but one must and I was not being too serious with that. I don't wear one, but I wouldn't object to wearing one. But it's helpful for us to remember that it's not so much the fact that he died that is significant for us, but the meaning of his death when taken with his resurrection. Never forget that. So we don't think of our Lord as a dead Savior although we think of him as a savior who died historically. He is alive forevermore. He was dead. And crucifixes have their little place, but it's a very small place. I remember Mr. Spurgeon saying that one time he visited uh, in a home and he saw a picture of an individual who had been a preacher and he said, my, that's a ghastly picture. In fact, he said, oh dear, what a ghastly picture. And the individual said to him, well, I understand. It was taken after he died. 
And Mr. Spurgeon said, well, get rid of it. It's not a picture of him. He was gone before the photograph was taken. <laughs> so uh, let us not forget that our Lord is not dead. He's alive. James Denny, I believe it was, used to like to say to his students that he would take a crucifix and he would hold it up and he would say, I would like to go throughout all of our Scottish churches and hold up this crucifix and say what Jesus Christ has done And that is certainly true. He has died, and this represents what he has done, but he is a living Savior today. Mr. Denny also said, no apostle ever remembered Christ. Isn't that interesting? No apostle, he said, ever remembered Christ. And then he went on to say, our Lord through the Holy Spirit had come to dwell with them and their lives were characterized by the sense of his personal presence, his continued presence. In fact, his eternal presence with them. So they did not remember him, they lived with him. And I say to you Christians, that's the way we should live too. Oh, certainly it's wonderful to read the Bible. You ought to always be reading through the Bible, I think. That's one place that I've failed so much through the years as you reach the years that I have lived. But the fundamental thing is for us to remember that He is with us constantly, and our lives are lives of constant communion with Him. Think of that. No apostle ever remembered Christ. John hears our Lord say that he has the keys of death and Hades. Look, the Savior has not only broken free from the prison of death, but he's carried away the keys with him so that he has, as the mediator, as the divine human mediator, he has the ultimate authority over every single soul in this universe. As I think Mr. Spurgeon also said, once he has the giant's head in his hand and has carried the witness of the victory to the city of God. The Cid was a great Spanish hero. He died. And it is said that his followers were engaged in a battle and the enemy feared the Cid, Rodrigo Diaz, as one of the greatest of the warriors of his day. And since the Cid had been killed, one of them conceived of the idea of setting the Cid who had not been buried yet on a horse and going into battle with the dead Cid on the horse as if he was still alive. And the story is that the enemy fled before the dead Sid. We don't have a dead Sid who is our leader. We have one who lives forever and ever. Let me conclude for a time is up. We don't want a picture of our Lord. Those who want a picture of our Lord would have only small consolation, even if they could know exactly how he appeared historically. What we need is a transforming vision and a sense of his personal presence today. This vision is designed to lead to adoration of the greatness of the Son of God and to trust in his provision. It has a very practical meaning for us as Christians. Do you fear? Do you have fears? Is there anything that actually makes you afraid of the experiences of life? Remember who he is. He's the first 
and the last. But do you fear something that is to come? He is the last. He will be there when it comes. You may say, well, I may be very sick or I have great physical problems. But our Lord is sufficient for all of those things. He's the first and the last. And sometimes intellectually men say, these are dreary days. Look at this little company of people who are here to worship our Lord, to hear the word of God, to be built up in the faith, and the vast numbers of people who are more interested in the cowboys than they are in Christ. Christianity is a failure, they say. No, Christianity is not a failure. Our Lord lives. He's the living one. And anyone identified with him is one who overcomes. I love the 77th Psalm because it's a beautiful psalm of an individual who was troubled, concerned about the experiences of life, but finally, in the 10th verse is the place where the camera focuses. Everything is hazy and blurred till that point. The camera is out of focus. But in the 10th verse, the psalmist wrote, and I said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember the wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. And finally he concludes with thou lettest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. The true focus leads us to the picture of the great shepherd. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all, we sing. I say what a fearful thing the vision is if we are not his. He is de jure, by the law of God, the king of the ages, and he is de facto, supreme in his kingdom. He's the Lord of the upper world and he's the Lord of the underworld. He has the keys of death and Hades. He's the one who sends his angels for his believers. He's the one who sends his angels to take the unbelievers off for eternal judgment. If Christ were here today, my Christian friend and my non-Christian friend, if Christ were here and you saw John's vision, what would you do? I know what you Christians would do. You'd do what John did. You'd fall down before his feet and you'd want to worship him. You'd be seeking him. You'd be looking to him as the one who's made it possible for you to have life. Let me say to you this. He says he's living. He said he's the living one. He says he's alive unto the ages of the ages. My friend, he is here. He is here right at this very moment. Forget your eyes, your physical eyes, and bow down before him. Give thanks to him as the Son of God who saves sinners by the blood that was shed and come into the family of God by his grace. May God speak to you to that end. Let's stand for the benediction. Father, we thank thee for this magnificent picture of our Lord, which we can only fallibly seek to understand. Lord, if there should be some here who have never believed in our Lord, in the presence of the message of the Holy Spirit concerning him, the Ancient of Days, one like the Son of Man who lives, was dead, offering the atoning sacrifice, but is alive forevermore. May by thy grace they come at this very moment, give thanks to thee for what he has done and pass from death into life. For Jesus' sake, amen. Thank you.